Hello and welcome. My name is Claudia Zeisberger. I'm a professor at INSEAD where I look after private equity, venture capital, and uh, at times also risk management. Today's topic is a very timely one. Is venture capital investing risky? And if so, is there anything that the investors, the CIOs, can do to de-risk it? Now, Venture capital returns have been well researched. So let me share just a few of the, um, the salient points to be aware of as you walk with me through the next few minutes. In venture capital, seven out of 10 portfolio companies are loss making, meaning they're returning, as we call so nicely, less than 1x, less than the money invested. By far the majority of those seven will need to be written off. Dispersion of the returns in venture capital are very wide, significantly wider than in public equity, for example. That means the difference between a top performing fund, a top quartile fund and bottom quartile funds are substantial, significant and have an impact on your investment's return. A few exits, a few unicorns in those private equity investments are responsible for 20% or times more for the total cash returned to investors in the industry. What does it mean when we look at a VC fund? So in a VC fund, expect the majority, in an early stage VC fund, expect the majority of companies to fail. Some of those will break even, and usually two to three statistically will have decent returns or are expected to have great returns because they need to do the heavy lifting of returning the money that investors invested and the desired returns, anywhere from 15 to 25 percent target uh, IRR that investors have in mind when they allocate to venture capital. Now, venture capital overall has what we call a power distribution. That means very few investments, just those very few investments up here, generate by far the majority of the returns. So you may wonder if this is the return profile of the venture capital asset class, why do so many institutional investors allocate to it? And especially we've seen family offices being very excited about this asset class and allocating if anything, more than the average uh, allocation out of their total AUM. Now, question that I just recently asked together with two venture capitalists in an article that we published and that you can access below. Is there anything that CIOs can do to de-risk their exposure to venture capital? Let's have a look at the reality of being a CIO when deciding on whether or not to invest in venture capital. So usually public equity is a large part of the portfolio of the total AUM allocated and public equity has a well-researched um, dispersion in terms of top to bottom quartile. As you can see, the difference between top and bottom quartile fund is uh, not significant. That changes when we move to PE over here, and it changes even further when we go to venture capital. So in venture capital, 50% is the dispersion, the difference between top quartile and bottom quartile funds, which obviously means the choices you make as a CIO when investing, when committing to venture capital funds has a dramatic impact on your overall portfolio returns. Question, can we obviously increase diversification? The argument being by having an asset class that has such a wide uh, dispersion, it looks really like a very badly diversified and undiversified public equity portfolio, very concentrated. So can we increase diversification and how do we do that? So let's go down that road. The question one obviously asks, I wanna diversify. So how much, how many startups are enough? Now, in the public equity space, we know that very well. Well-researched portfolio theory tells us that anywhere between 20, more recently 40 to 70 public equity stocks can give you a reasonably diversified 
public equity portfolio. Now, how many startups now are enough? How many startups do I need to be able to justify my exposure to venture capital and to be able to say that my portfolio is diversified? Now, you may get excited when you see 30 to 40 appear as a number, uh, because usually 30 to 40 is the number of startups you will find in one venture capital fund. But as always in venture capital, it's not that easy. Let's recall the mortality rate of startups. Remember, two-thirds of VC deals fail. So if I want to build a portfolio of 20 to 70 startups that are alive and well by the end of the fund, so we can reasonably argue we can exit them, a fund would need to start off with a portfolio of 60 to 200 investee firms, 60 to 200 startups. Now, when you look at the funds, very few of the funds basically meet this requirement. You can now argue that as an LP, we can do something about that. So, and as we know, VC is not a business of averages. If anything, it's a business of strikeouts and home runs that you're trying to balance in your portfolio. Now, there is an interesting uh, study that is quite well known, has been around for a long time, and all credit to Correlation Ventures, which run this in 2014. They allocated, a, uh, they designed a portfolio of over 20,000 investments, and then basically said, let's have a look at the kind of returns that those portfolios, uh, those uh, investments generate. So over 20,000 financing, a reasonably uh, res a respectable and a reasonably large database. Now, below you will see the returns from 0 to 1x, so all the way to 50x. So let's have a look at the, um, let's have a look at the, at the distribution. So 65% of those 20,000 uh, uh, investments are loss-making. They return between 0 and 1x, meaning they will return less money than invested to investors. 10% or more return 5x. So up to here, 10% will return 5x. Only 4% will return 10x and mainly 1 in 250 investments will return over 50x, potentially being one of those uh, elusive unicorns. Now, how can we basically uh, replicate that? We asked in our article. So we're saying, okay, one in 250 investments give us potentially a home run. So let's basically create two sample portfolios. What did we do? We created two sample portfolios using IRR from Monte Carlo simulation of about 2,000 funds. And we picked the deals using deal-by-deal -deal distribution probability from correlation ventures. So on the right-hand side, a reminder of the dispersion in a public equity portfolio. On the left-hand side, you see our Monte Carlo simulation with a total of 15 VC deals. So again, as we expect, a very wide dispersion with a barely 10% um, median return. Now, let's have a look what it means if we increase the number of startups in our portfolio to 500. So Monte Carlo simulation with 500 venture capital deals. All of a sudden, our picture is a much more acceptable one because all of a sudden our VC portfolio range of returns tightens to 10 to 17 percent difference between top performing and bottom performing funds. So that's quite similar now, or much more uh, like a public equity portfolio. Also, our, um, our uh, overall returns, our median returns basically increase as well. So that was basically interesting. Now, let me summarize four LPs, what our golden rules of VC investing are. Number one, 
try to build a portfolio that exposes you to 500 startups or at a minimum to more than 100 startups. That obviously should be done keeping uh, geographic diversification in mind, keeping uh, vintage diversification in mind, and so on. More on that in detail in the article below this video. That basically allows you to create almost an index of venture capital early stage exposures, which gives you a second quartile return, which is much more acceptable and beats certainly 50 to 70% of VC funds that invest by mainly picking deals. So the answer we asked you at the beginning of the lecture, can VC be de-risked? The answer is yes, with suitable high diversification, VC indeed becomes a much more palatable asset class than past research uh, has shown. Now, so far I've kept the uh, responsibility with the LPs. You may ask, are there not any funds out there that are trying to give their LPs exposure to a much larger uh, number of startups? And the answer to the question is yes. There are few and more and more joining this group. So one of the better known ones is uh, maybe the best known accelerator out there is Y Combinator, which bets clearly on large numbers. It has a 15 year history. And during that time, Y Combinator made 2000 investments of which 19 became worth more than a billion dollars, i.e. unicorns. And so basically achieving an almost 1% unicorn yield. That's impressive. Some of those unicorns are pretty much household names. So what is their model? The model Y Combinator runs is to accept twice a year, somewhere around 150 startups into their accelerator program. The result means that they gain per annum an exposure to 300 startups, which is eight to 10 times more than most VC funds will gain over their three year investment period. The result, Y Combinator is pretty much a quasi index of the early stage VC industry. Now, are there others out there? Yes, absolutely. For the last decade, 500 startups has been running a similar model, nevertheless, much more globally diversified with uh, local um, funds in different regions, as has AngelList starting in 2015. And in the last few years, more and more funds have joined this kind of experiment. So let me summarize the, uh, the risk in, uh, in VCs. So number one, investing in venture capital can be de-risk. So yes, dear CIOs, you can de-risk your exposure. Diversification benefits kick in with an exposure of a, to a minimum of 100 startups in your portfolio. Nevertheless, to achieve full benefits, you should target exposure to 500 investments. Some funds have indeed tried to run this model, making it life a little bit easier for the LPs to allocate to them. And it may be worthwhile keeping an eye on some of those more recent funds that have basically run this experiment. Now, there's obviously a lot more to be said about uh, the riskiness of venture capital. And I will, so number one, ask you to share your comments below this video after having read our article, which goes into much greater detail into our little experiment. And I will share in uh, following videos more of the, uh, of the feedback that we have received. Obviously, the questions that I'm interested in is to expand the research and say, what happens if we look at later stage VCs? What happens if we look at follow on investments, i.e. a venture capital fund that has allocated to a startup in uh, seed round or round A and continues to re-up in subsequent rounds. What is the return profile of those investments? Anyway, thank you very much. If you liked the video, please give it a like and subscribe to my channel so you're being uh, kept posted on part two and three of this lecture theory series. Thank you very much.